Good afternoon. My name is Megan Coffey, and I am a sophomore at Quorum Deo, and it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to our, our speaker tonight, my uncle Kevin. <laughs> um, he recently sent me his resume, and I have learned more about him reading it than anything he has ever said to me, so <laughs> I will read it to you. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Kevin Gerard was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps after graduating from the Citadel in 1995. An infantry officer, he has served in various command and staff assignments in the United States and abroad in Africa, South America, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, including two tours of duty in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has commanded 3rd Force Reconnaissance Company and Security Cooperation Team in Jordan, as well as served as the Deputy Chief of Staff, Marine Forces Southern Command. Currently, he commands Marine Corps Advisor Company A at Joint Base Anacostia outside of Washington, D.C. As the family overachiever, he earned not one, but two undergraduate degrees in history and education as well as completing two graduate degrees, one in national security studies and the other in education. His milita military training includes U.S. Army Ranger and Airborne Schools and a variety of specialized infantry, reconnaissance, and anti-terrorism courses. In addition to his continued service in the Marine Corps Reserve, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Specialty Orthopedics, headquartered in his hometown of Gainesville, Georgia. Colonel Gerard has two brothers serving as general officers in the U.S. Army and a little sister who is an ordinary homeschool mom. <laughs> Kevin is married to my Aunt Kelly, and they are the proud parents of four children. In conclusion, I would like to share a personal story of my beloved Uncle Kevin. When I was 10, I was riding horses with all my cousins, and I got kicked, and no parents were around. And it was Uncle Kevin that met me at the ER, and he sat with me while I got stitches. It was very nice of him, and I'll always be appreciative of him. But I remember how he was watching the lady stitch up my leg, and I asked him why, and he said, so that next time, we might not have to go to the doctor. <laughs> Please welcome my extraordinary uncle, Colonel Kevin Gerard. We always take the girls to the doctor, Maggie. It's the boys that get sewn up with fishing line. Uh, uh, thank you, Megan, that was precious. I bring you greetings from our nation's capital. I've flown in this afternoon. My brother-in-law's colleagues were able to siphon enough gas to get that Delta 727 off the ground there, so I'm thankful to be with you at Faith Bible Church today. Let me begin where we should begin with some thank yous. So graduates, uh, you might pay attention to the emphasis on thankfulness in what I say if you have not already spent some time thanking those who have made this day possible, I hope you will do so. Thank you, Dr. Tinsley. What an introduction, uh, hearing from Pilgrim's Progress. The, other than the English Bible, Pilgrim's Progress is the most prolific book in the world. Um, most Americans don't know that. Most Americans don't have a copy, but until the previous century, the two books that were in most homes were the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. Thank you to the teachers and the staff of Coram Deo Classical School. I, I know we have many of you here. Let me just say as a former teacher myself how thankful I am for you, for your commitment to excellence on behalf of a grateful nation. Your role in training up this generation of young people is deeply appreciated. Thank you to the parents, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, other extended family members. Your presence here today reminds us that raising children is a team sport. It's not hard to be a parent. You just wake up and open a vein, right? <laughs> Sometimes literally. Uh, often figuratively. 
transferring our life and vitality from mothers and fathers to our beloved children. So thank you to the families. Thank you to Faith Bible Church. It's good to be back here again. I was here just several weeks ago. I'm always thankful to be here, thankful for this church and the other churches that are represented by the families that are here today. Without biblically sound churches, churches, Christians have no context to live out fully the one another's of Scripture. There is no more important institution than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. All others will pass away. Only the church remains as an eternal institution. And now to the graduates. I've left you a gift in your seat. Uh, as a graduate of a classical school, I expect that all of you will be able to translate for me by the end of the ceremony, the Latin inscription on that coin. I'll, maybe I'll call on a couple of you to do so. <laughs> no uh, dictionaries allowed. That'll be your pop quiz at the end. What fine looking men and women fine-looking young men and women. It is said that the Emperor Napoleon, as he reviewed the ship's company of Marines aboard Her Majesty's ship Bellepharon that would carry him into exile, said of those 100 Marines, ah, what could be done with even a hundred such as these? That's certainly my feelings as I look at this fine assemblage of American youth. What could be done? What will be done? with even this few. I feel a, an unyielding sense of urgency. I've, I only have a very few minutes with you graduates. I have taken about 20 or 30 hours of things that I feel compelled to say to you and culled it to just a few precious minutes. Possibility and potential exudes from you what stories will be written about your lives. I'm thankful that Dr. Tinsley chose for the descriptor of my comments the word exhortation. That's a wonderful word. It's not used much in our modern world, which makes me love it even more. Exhortation, or the root exhort, in my favorite dictionary, the only dictionary that I own, the Mr. Webster's 1828 edition, has this to say about these words, to encourage, to embolden, to cheer, to advise, to excite, give strength, spirit, and courage. To advise, to warn, to caution, to excite, insight, to stimulate, or exertion. To use words or arguments to incite to good deeds. Incitement to that which is good and commendable. It is a tall order indeed to live up with Mr. Webster's definition and description and thus my sense of urgency. So much left to be taught. As a former teacher, I always thought at the end of the year, just one more lecture. Just give me one more class period. Every parent longs for one more opportunity to transfer a lesson as you drive to drop off your college freshman this fall. Each time I've led Marines to war, I've wanted one more moment, one more opportunity to transfer to them something that might keep them alive. Never enough time. Our time is nearly up. For you graduates, soon you will wade into the fray. Preparation finished, the battle ahead. Listen then, that's my exhortation to you, listen to what I have to say to you. The checklists are written in blood. What I say to you has been hard earned. The Bible exhorts us to take heed to yourselves lest you forget what your eyes have seen. Take heed to yourselves lest you forget what my eyes have seen and what I am desperately trying to communicate to you this afternoon. Lest you forget what you have seen modeled in your homes in your families, in your churches, and by your instructors. Lest you forget, and by forgetting, exchange the truth for lies and endanger your souls. Twenty centuries ago, the apostle Peter addressed his first epistle to the pilgrims, exiles, and sojourners living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, 
Bithynia and Asia, what makes up today the modern nation of Turkey. It does not do violence to the text, I think, to extrapolate his imperatives to those Christians, to us now living in the 21st century, and most specifically to you, the class of 2021 at Corum Deo Classical School. Time does not permit a full exposition of that epistle, so I leave you with a final homework, experience, final homework assignment. One more thing to do before I consider your education complete. I want you to read and reread and meditate on 1 Peter. It is applicable to what you are about to embark upon. As you prepare for matriculation this fall, hear and heed the words of Peter. First, let's note the similarities between the cultures of first century Rome and 21st century America for believing Christians. We are both minorities living in a hostile world, a thoroughly pagan culture. Peter's description of first century culture sounds uncannily familiar. Lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, much like Vanity Fair. As it was in Rome, so it is now with America. Pagan cultures, to which America certainly now belongs, are characterized by at least three categories of sin. Sexual immorality, self-mutilation or self-harm, and human sacrifice. Specifically and most frequently, that sacrifice comes in the form of infanticide. For the last five decades, the United States of America, my country, the land I love and defend, has been objectifying our women, emasculating our men, and murdering our children. If this is not paganism, then what is? The culture writ large, your future classmates, your co-workers, your neighbors in those college towns, as in Peter's day, will think it strange that you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery as they malign you. Chapter 4, verse 4. Make no mistake, war, spiritual war is afoot, and our world is aflame. The prince of this world, our adversary, Peter warns, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The apostles of atheism, the evangelists of the sexual revolution, and the clergy of chaos dominate American academy, the media, and our corporate institutions. Their commissars, their inquisitors, stand ready to identify, humiliate, and banish any voice that rises to question their orthodoxy. In the main, they have left theoretical Marxism in the rearview mirror, jettisoning it in favor of the more virulent and eventually violent doctrines of Maoism and Bolshevism, reinvented with new lexicons under the banners of intersectionality and critical theory. You see, words do have meaning after all, which is why our American neo-Maoists must dominate and subjugate our common language. They read Mr. Carroll's through the looking glass very carefully. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that is all. Poor Alice, like so many Americans, while she wasn't looking, malevolent forces have been on the march. While average citizens were not paying attention, the Bolsheviks infiltrated and now dominate, twisting and remaking businesses, churches, schools, and civic 
organizations and to their thinly veiled totalitarianism. We thought that communism died with the Soviet Union. The reality is that bad ideas never die. They just hibernate in our colleges and universities, waiting for the spring thaw and the rebirth of the revolution. This time, not from without, but from within. Well, that's rather a bleak assessment of things. How shall we then live, Mr. Schaefer asked some decades ago, and I ask it again today. Quickly now, how does 1 Peter tell us that we must live? How and what does he exhort us to do in the midst of a sin-wracked Genesis 3 world? Well, before you can do something, you must be something. Peter insists that his readers must be born again. That's the only time in the New Testament that that particular phrase referring to the conversion of the lost is used outside the Gospel of John. Peter says it again. We must be born again. Each of us must be born again, acknowledging our inherently sinful nature and our helpless estate. Repenting of our sin, which means to turn from walking after the ways of the world and walk in the newness of life by the shed blood of Christ Jesus. Turning from our former wickedness and walking in the truth. Trusting in the scriptures is our only rule for life and practice and looking for the return of the Lord Jesus. You and I, graduates, must be something before we do something. And what Peter says we must be is born again. Well, being born again, becoming one of God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, as he describes it, redefines our primary identity from the world and our former ways to identity in Christ. We are of Christ. We are in Christ. Born again believers grow in Christ likeness day by day. Well, Peter further explains the identity of Christ's people with four metaphors. We are, you and I, born again Christians, are four things, Peter says. We are sojourners, saints, stewards, and sufferers. Sojourners, saints, stewards, and sufferers. Sojourners. The book is called Pilgrim's Progress. It's a Bible word, pilgrim. Someone who is passing through. We are sojourners, pilgrims, exiles, strangers. The longer I live, the more my grip on this world is loosened. And I lift up my countenance from the here and now to the hereafter, looking, as Christian did, for the celestial city. This is not our home. Everything that we see here under the sun is passing away. We look to a better country. We are sojourners. Secondly, we're saints, God's people, joint heirs with Christ. As historic evangelical Protestants, we mean something very different than Roman Catholics do when we use the word saints, when Scripture uses the word saints. We're not talking about super Christians. We're talking about our identity, every one of us who is born again in Christ Jesus. We are enabled by the Holy Spirit to live as saints, holy ones. Peter says, be ye holy. We're to live holy lives. If you were accused, you and I, accused of being Christians, would there be enough evidence to send us to the stake. I pray so. We're to eschew sin, mortify the flesh, flee temptation, and beware the world, the flesh, and the devil. Thirdly, Peter calls us to be stewards, caretakers, guardians, in financial terms, fiduciaries. What is it that we're caring for, protecting, investing, and guarding? Peter says, the manifold, 
the plainly revealed, the abundant, the manifold grace of God. We are to exercise our rule as stewards by ministering the good gifts of God to one another and to all men everywhere. If anyone ministers, Peter says, let him do it as with the ability that which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Fourthly, believers are called sufferers. Much of 1 Peter speaks to this subject, suffering. We are called to suffer. 1 Peter obliterates the prosperity gospel, which looks to comfort and ease here in this life. God promises us not riches, not comfort, not perfect health, not complication-free relationships, but suffering. Why? Because God is more interested in our holiness than our happiness. Let me say that again. God is more interested in our holiness than in our happiness. Suffering produces righteousness. How many times have you heard your parents or your coaches perhaps say, in difficult circumstances, it builds character? (laughs) If you're my children, you probably heard it too much. We are called to be sufferers. Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. If the Lord Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, we must identify with Him in His suffering. Again, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Prepare to suffer, Christians. The question is not will we suffer, but what we will do when the suffering comes. Ours is not a hopeless, meaningless suffering of materialism. It is not the sadistic suffering of asceticism. Rather, it is redeemed by the work of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 14, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And finally, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. Well, let me bring us to the end. Great adventures lie ahead. That should frighten you. The great adventure of life is filled with adversity, hardship, and challenges. You've tasted of that thus far in your journey, but with training wheels or guardrails or other protective equipment. Soon, you will stand alone. What did Samwise Gamgee say about great adventures? It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad has happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. I know now folks in these stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something, that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Well, when I see you, I am encouraged Graduates, there is some good worth fighting for. 
God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The battle is soon to be joined. We might even imagine in our mind's eye hearing the tumult of battle when you walk through those doors. Folks like me are passing from the scene. I hand over a baton to you figuratively today. It is encouraging to me to see such youth and exuberance. I pray that that exuberance will be tempered with wisdom, godly wisdom. Our nation depends upon it. Let me finish with Peter's benediction. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.